in your mind 72 to today, and what's changed in the world, in your world, from 72 to today, I want to take you back to 1885. In 1885, people lit their homes with kerosene lanterns. And electricity, right about 1885, begins to light the night. You can walk out into the street, and there's street lights. And homes in the cities are beginning, beginning to get lit with electricity. The first electric tramway between Boston and Harvard, where I got my doctorate, went in in 1887. In 1885, it was an all-day adventure to go from Boston to Harvard and back on horseback. In 1887, it was a 15-minute ride each way. All day, 15 minutes. All day, 15 minutes. The telephone was invented, and people could talk to each other over distances. The first substantial increase in communication since the Roman roads. The internal combustion engine was developed, and it brought us automobiles. This is a 1924 model. And it brought us aircraft and airplanes. And it brought us all the industries and structure associated with that. The oil industry grew up, asphalt, roadways, concrete, bridges. All of that happened between 1885 and, two th and uh, 1925. Here's an early electric washing machine, a home appliance. The home appliance industry really didn't pop till the 30s and 40s, but it was there. Here's a holler of tabulating machine, first used before 1900. It's the birth of punch cards and what eventually becomes IBM. It's an electric machine for tabulating and uh, some amount of calculating. Now, that's the world turned upside down in 40 years. From kerosene and horseback and dark nights to a world that's not that different from our own. So if you think you live in volatile times, and I'm leaving out the world war. You think you live in volatile times. You don't. These are great times. These are times that they hoped for. These are times where we're not being ripped apart by, by world war and innovation. Innovation's always good? Well, guess I know. But let's remember that, that volatile times, this isn't the first time that we've had volatile times. What's happened since 1972 to today? Lots of stuff, computers, internet. You can watch the movie on your phone. You can watch a movie on your tablet. You can watch a movie on your big screen. You can tweet. You can distance learn. Has it turned the world upside down as much as this stuff did? I don't think so, but that's just my opinion. I remember being at a conference like this in 1965. I'm that old. And we knew what was going to happen in the future. We had futurists then, too. And they were just as future-oriented as the futurists are today. We knew that by 2012, what would happen? We would be able to cure cancer. What was going to happen? We were going to have clean, cheap energy. Probably fusion power, but maybe something else. What was going to happen? We were going to colonize the planets. We didn't know why, but we were going to do it. <laughs> we were going to have hypersonic, continent-spanning travel anywhere in the world in two hours. We were going to have automatic language translation so anybody could sit in a room and talk to anybody else through a little earpiece like Star Trek. No, we knew it. What's going to happen? It was just computers, we thought. We were going to feed the world. Now, none of us projected that we were going to have computers up the wazoo. But that's what we got. We didn't get that other stuff. And so when you think about the future, and you think about volatile times, one of the things I think about all the time is, you're not going to get what you want. You're going to get what you get. So when you think about technology futures, don't just think about, boy, I wish this. Stuff that's going to happen and maybe it's good, and maybe it's not, but it's what, what 
people come up with. It's not necessarily what you want. There's going to be stuff that happens in biotech. You're going to say, oh, no, don't do that. Don't cross that kangaroo with that moose. <laughs> I do strategy. And today, strategy doesn't look so much like it did back in those early days of the 20th century. We're much more into design nowadays. We design businesses more so than just make a product. Uh, the make a product thing is so exciting right now. Everybody loves iPhones and, iPad, and, and, and we think about Apple's strategy as being a product almost. But a real strategy is a design. Here's eHarmony, a really nice company. It helps people get married. eHarmony accounts for 2% of the marriages in the United States, if you can believe it right now. now. How do you do this? How do you set up a website that helps people get married? I want to show you its policies. To sign up on eHarmony, you have to fill out a questionnaire with 250 questions. And it takes a long time. It took me two hours. <laughs> it's like a final exam. You have to have private, extensive self-description. And you have to answer questions about yourself, like how do your friends describe you and blah. Attractive, sexy, you, have, you say things like that. But what I'm coming to is that you don't say things like that. They have a matching algorithm. They, they studied 4,000 family, uh, married couples and tried to deduce what it is that makes married couples happy. I mean, their, their, their Y variable was happiness. So they're trying to put couples together that will be happy. Um, after you've done all this, set up, you actually have to pay money. You have to pay three to $500 for a month's access. It depends on how you sign up and when. But let's say you know, maybe $100. You have to wait a day before seven potential matches show up. And then you can't just like, look at their pictures. You have to engage in what they call guided communication, which is sort of the way your parents would want you to talk to a girl. And you're not. And then after that, you keep paying $60 a month. Now, why does this work? Why does this work? You know, there's so many web things out there that they can't make any money. These guys actually charge a lot per month. And why does it work? It works. Look at the cleverness of the design. It works because it keeps out looky-loos. It keeps out people who want a hot date. It keeps out people who are only interested in how the potential partner looks. It's just going to scan down 1,000 pictures. It keeps out a lot. It filters in only the people who are serious about finding a partner. Now, that's design. That's the design of a business system that's carefully balanced. And if you go into this business, you say, oh, let's make it 10 times as big. You're going to destroy it. It's designed to do what it does. And it does what it does quite well. Now, how do we adapt that to other cultures? How do we do this in India? How do we do this in Australia, where I don't know how people meet? I guess at the beach. <laughs> oh, they have wonderful TV advertising about you know, happy couples. Actually, the ordinary looking people, happy couples up there, oh, we, it works very great. So that's a successful business strategy. And that's very much what we do today. We're, we're, we're trying to build businesses that help people, involve people, put people together. It's also part of the service economy. How do we do strategy? I want to tell you two stories, two quick stories that you can take away. One, 1895, oh, I'm sorry, it's so old. Andrew Carnegie is the richest man in the world. He's built US Steel, and he's holding forth at a cocktail party in Pittsburgh. And he's introduced to a young man who's introduced to him as a young management consultant. Well, there are hardly any management consultants in 1895, and it's, it's a guy named Frederick Taylor. And Carnegie's chomping on his cigar, this guy's surrounded by his admirers. And he turns to this person and he says, young man, if you can tell me something worth hearing about management, I'll write you a check for $10,000. 
a lot of money in 1895. And the room goes, shh. Everybody turns to listen. What, what's this kid going to say? And the kid says, Mr. Carnegie, I'd advise you to make a list of the five most important things you can do and start on number one. <laughs> now the story goes, uh, he gets a check for $10,000. Now when I first heard this story, I was in Pittsburgh and a steel man was telling it to me, I thought he was making a joke about me because I was a consultant. And it's like, this is the kind of worthless advice you get <laughs> from consultants. Because you can open up any self-help book and it'll always say, make a list. I mean, you know, just write the book yourself, make a list. But if you listen to Taylor's advice, it isn't make a list. If I ask my students to make a list of the most important things in their lives, they're going to say, world peace, happiness, religious fulfillment, raising decent children, all these great aspirations. If I say, make a list of the stuff you're going to do, get the car fixed, pay the rent, pick up the cleaning. Now, what Taylor is asking Carnegie to do is the heart of strategic thinking. It is. Over here on my left, I have a list of things that are important. And over here on the right, I have a list of things that I can do. And I'm looking for a match. I'm looking for what's the most important thing I can actually do something about. I'm looking for that click. And each of us will come up with a different click. But that's the heart of it. That's what Stephen's talking about when he says focus. That's the focus. We focus on what's really important that's doable. It's not the dream we have. Don't give up your dreams. Don't give up your aspirations. But take a step that you can take and move in that direction. And that's, that's the very heart of strategic thinking. The second story I want to tell you about is about a certain kind of leadership. And this is, again, an old story for you, but this goes back to my first job as an aerospace engineer working at Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena, California. We didn't do manned stuff. We were, we were, we were unmanned. We still are. JPL has that thing on the Mars right now going around and disturbing the Martians. We were tasked to go with the moon and see what it looked like. Nobody knew what the moon's surface looked like. This is a picture of the way the moon looked to us in 1963. We didn't know what it looked like up close. So we had to build a vehicle to go there. But for the, to build a vehicle to go there, you had to know what you're landing on. So we got scientists. And scientists came in. We had some scientists. And they said, it's very powdery. It's like talcum powder. Millions of years of meteor impact have turned it into a fine powder. When you land on it, your rockets are going to throw up dust. It's going to fall on top of the thing and bury it. Ha, ha, ha. That's scientists. That's what you get. So then we had other scientists. The second group of scientists came in. This is a God's honest truth story. Second group of scientists came in, and they said, no, it's little pointy things sticking up, like the stalagmites go up in the cave. And, and that had to do with some kind of ablation process and photonic rays. I don't remember the theory, but there were these pointy things that were very difficult to land on. A third group of scientists said, no, it's like giant boulder fields, like a field at the base of a mountain with boulders the size of cars and buses. And if you try to land on it, you're going to fall in the cracks. So what do you do? My boss, Phyllis Bewolda, engineering manager, homeschooled in Montana, wrote a two-page document called The Lunar Surface. And she said, the lunar surface is hard, flat, slightly sandy. It's tilted no more than 15 degrees. And it's got a rock about two feet across every 40 or 50 feet. I looked at it. And I said, Phyllis, this is what the Southwest Desert looks like. This is what the center of Australia looks like. I mean, what do you, you don't know that the moon's like that. This is all we know. And she said, well, I don't know. The flat parts of the Earth look like that. And we're going to a flat part of the moon. I said, yeah, but you don't know. How can you do this? And she said, look, the engineers can't work without a specification. So here's a specification. 
If it's a lot harder than this, we're not going to be spending much time on the moon anyway. <laughs> In 1969, the second Apollo mission to the moon, the commander walked over and gave the surveyor vehicle a pinch. You can see it on the moon, and you can see that Phyllis is pretty much right about what the lunar surface was like. Phyllis's story is a leadership story. It's about what real leaders do. Real leaders don't just point and say, double EBITDA. They don't just say, somebody solved this problem. What they do is they take responsibility for how we're going to approach this thing. It take, taking responsibility doesn't mean, if it blows up, blame me. There's a little bit of that. But taking, she took responsibility for creating an organizational environment, an organizational set of ideas, goals, principles, where the people could work. When we had the pointy, powdery, bouldery moon, nobody knew what to do. That's a, that's a challenge the organization couldn't deal with. And so she defined a challenge that we could deal with so we could take that first step and get there and then look around and say, hmm, this is what it looks like. So leadership in a volatile world is figuring out how to take these steps and learn about where you are next and learn from Phyllis about taking responsibility. Thank you.